You are watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Psalms number one, this is very familiar. We'll just read it for a, a context and then we will get started here. We started here uh, two weeks ago, uh, a summer series on psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so I'm going to read verse one of one. This is the introduction to the book. Blessed is the man who walks not on the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight. Somebody say his delight. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Somebody say, yes, Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Let me give you a five-minute recap for those who missed the last two Wednesday nights. Um, we are looking at these passages, these, these beautiful psalms, um, not simply as a hymnal, although it can be thought of as the Christian's hymnal. We are looking them at them not only as prayers and supplications of heart, but they can be looked at that way. We're not just looking at them as a book of evidences, or shall I say, fulfilled prophecies. But it is true, the Psalms are full of fulfilled prophecies, particularly messianic prophecies. Finally, we're not simply looking at them as a guide on how to please the Lord and honor, honor Him with our lives, although the Psalms can be fairly reviewed in that manner. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we see them as... The poetry they are, we see them as the history that they are. We see them as the beautiful prayers that they are. We see them as admissions of the heights and depths of the human emotional experience. Uh, and we see them as fulfilled prophecy. We f see them as uh, literary history. They are all of these things and they are more. They are also profoundly spiritual, which would lead uh, the writers to, to speak to us in this, in, in this kind of, of manner. S Ephesians 5 and 9, 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The writer Paul refers to the spiritual element that is involved here. Psalms, hymns, spiritual song, songs, in my personal experience and in my opinion, is the shortest distance between two spiritual places. Remember the Old Testament passage where the prophet says, we're not ready yet. Someone call a, call a, a harpist and they're going to come and play and we're going to worship the Lord. Uh, I sincerely believe that hymns, songs, spiritual songs are the shortest distance from a place where you are not feeling close to the Spirit to a very close perception of the Spirit of the Lord. Like it or not, uh, we are emotional beings and w there is not an element of our life that we do not see through an emotional perspective or window. Uh, you can tell yourself to be stoical. You might succeed, but really it's not a very human thing to do. And if you read the philosophy of the Stoics, which I, I, I have read a good bit because I have a small interest in that kind of a thing, um, you are struck with the sense that these people are fundamentally asking me to deny the very thing that makes me human. And so the psalmist does not pretend that the heights and depths of human emotion don't exist. He takes you there, but he doesn't leave you there. The emotional, it's almost like a game of touch and go. The, the, the psalmist takes you to that. You touch it, you don't stay there. He takes you back to the promises of God. And we referred this past Wednesday night to David's example of saying, when I considered the prosperity and the blessing of the, the unrighteous, the wicked, my foot almost slipped. And when we see people who are sincere people trying to serve the Lord go through difficult things, there's something in our heart saying, how could this happen? David takes us a shortcut, an emotional shortcut to that sensation. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, my foot almost stumbled. 
But when I got back to the house of the Lord and I considered the end of the matter, oh, hallelujah. And so the Psalms, they are, as it were, conductors of human emotion. And they conduct it from where it is to where it needs to be. Where it is right now, for example, may be much discouragement and despair. But the Psalms will conduct that emotion back to a spiritual place where you can see the end of the matter. Very quickly on Hebrew poetry, the most important thing you have to know is that in the, in the Western style of literature, we rhyme words primarily. That is the, the sound, uh, even if it's not poetry but prose, there is a certain meter and a certain completeness when the words are fitted together in, a, in, a, in a, uh, the, the manner of a craftsman in a beautiful manner. But particularly in poetry, the sound, it's not un- like a natural evolution of poetry into song and what we would consider today as a songwriter that's how they are writing in the psalms that's how david remember i gave you the example uh he's sitting on a hillside you want to see it in your mind this is this is how it happened and was in this time uh, uh the performance of a psalm and he has a liar uh which is not someone who can't tell the truth but is some type of a uh precursor to a guitar let's say and uh he is going to strum a chord on that and as the cord hangs in the air he is going to speak a psalm nowadays we have a choir we have a drum set we have rhythm we have foot stomping we have bop boo do ah, do bop 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 we do all that business you want to imagine how it sounded in an ancient hillside it was much more a cord is strummed and the notes hang on the air and the psalmist says blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. And the cord fades. And he may change a slight derivation or change of chord. And he strums again and the sound hangs in the air. And he says, nor stands in the path of sinners. And strum, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. These psalms were meant to be accompanied by uh, music. It didn't sound like us. That's okay. But they very much were. So... We look at these psalms, we become familiar with the poetry of them, Uh, we get insight into God's character, we get pictures of Christ in prophecy, we get the literal history of fulfilled prophecy. But remember, the most important thing in Hebrew poetry is that they do not rhyme words, they rhyme ideas. This is the most important thing to understand in understanding poetry, not just in the Psalms, but all poetry. A lot of major and minor prophets write in poetry, and although they may not have set it to music, uh, it very much was the idea of a, a, a concept rhyming with the concept and so we read blessed is the man walks not in the counsel of the ungodly now the idea he offers secondly is going to rhyme with the further one first one nor stands in the path of the sinners and here comes a third rhyme nor sits in the seat of the scornful uh, so this gives you uh, ideas and there's tons of technical information that I've went over and very briefly because uh, you know I just putting some people straight to sleep uh, but this idea of a synonymous parallelism That's what we read here in the beginning of Psalms 1. Antithetical parallelism. That's what happens in verse number uh, 4. Talk about the righteous man, and now we're going to do antithetical parallelism. But the ungodly are not so. We're still rhyming ideas, but we're not just rhyming them as synonyms. We're sometimes rhyming them as antonyms. Progressive parallelism. uh, Introverted. I talked about all of this. But the idea you've got to get, if you want to really understand the richness, of the Psalms is look for the idea rhyme. Uh, sometimes the idea is almost meditative like Psalms 119 where an uh, idea is repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. It's explored in this context and explored in that context but it is meditative. It is like a drum that, that, that is sounded over and over again. So with that quick review, let's start talking about two Psalms tonight. I'm not going to go uh, 
super in depth, um, but I want to touch on these as a way of enlightening it. And the first one, of course, is this way, this picture of the righteous man in Psalms number one. And I want to point out this that is, I think, quite important. The first introduction to a righteous man you're given is not in what he does do, but what he does not do. Uh, You guys have heard me teach this before. Sometimes it's easier to to define yourself in terms of what you're not going to do than it is to know exactly what you should do. Does that that make sense? This is a great exercise whenever you hesitate in front of a decision. Uh, You hesitate in front of uh, something that you're not sure you want get it right but there's you're you're worried Uh, try to frame both sides of it well this would be too much so I'm not going to do that that would be an overreaction on this side this would be not taking it seriously enough what you've done is you've created for yourself two as it were stakes on each side of the road Uh, if you've ever been out west in a big snowstorm uh, I never forget going through west Texas in a big snowstorm in the middle of the night Uh, I don't do stuff like this anymore but when you're young you think you know you're above disaster and setback and you literally in that texas plane you could not see any of the road and when i say it was all white i am not being dramatic i'm not trying to impress you i'm speaking a literal truth there was no road in sight just a field of snow but in texas in the plains where they have this problem every mile they put two reflectors and when you can't see the road at all, you see two dots of light in the middle. Now, in the south, that wouldn't work because our roads curve so much. You'd see two dots, and you'd be off, and you know, you'd be in Texas by accident. Uh, but in, in the plain states, you see two dots of light gleaming at you. And what you do is you aim for the middle of those two reflectors, and that's how you stay on the highway. I did it for 250 miles between Dallas and Amarillo in the middle of the night because I didn't have any good sense but uh, you understand the point when you define yourself by what you're not going to do it gives you a marker on each side of the dilemma I don't know exactly how to handle this but I'm not going to do this that would to unbe- be to not take it seriously and I'm not going to do this because that would be to overreact the, tr- the, the, the goal has to be somewhere in the middle or as we would think in Christian terminology to be a temperate person On this side is intemperance. On this side is intemperance. But in the middle somewhere, even if I don't get it exactly right, I know I'm going to get pretty close. So the the man is defined by what he is not. I am not going to do these things. I'm not going to take counsel from the ungodly. I'm not going to stand in the path of sinners. I'm not going to sit in the seat of the scornful. I don't know everything I might ought to do, but I know what I'm not going to do. There's a great confidence that can come to an individual when you set some rules in your own heart that are not about pleasing a preacher. They're not about managing your neighbor. They're not about griping out somebody that you don't get along with. And they're certainly not about your personal hobby of criticizing people. They are about your rules. And you say, I am not going to live this way. I refuse to live this way. This is my mark right here. I'm not doing that. I think that's what it means to please God. If you're trying to please your neighbor, who are you serving? Let me move along. So uh, we see this, this man defined by what he's not. And notice what he says. Basically, if you want to sum up those first two verses, he is saying this. First of all, I'm going to control my influences. Now that is a powerful, a powerful pot of wisdom. Right there. I'm going to control my influences. Uh, A self-help guy named Jim Rome came up with an idea a few years back. He's the one who made it famous. And I, I, I totally rip it off and occasionally give him credit for it. But I think it gets a fundamental truth. And he said this. You are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. That's a pretty heavy way to think about things. If we hang out with people who are fractious, we're probably going to be fractious. If we hang around people who are critical, we're probably going to soothe our inner doubts by criticizing others. If we hang out with the discontented, we're going to learn the paths of discontent. You hang out with partiers, you'll be a partier. You hang out with A students, you'll be an A student. 
You say it's more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah, but you get the idea. I am not going to, def- I'm not going to, I- I've set some things I'm not going to do. And the first thing that I'm not going to do is I'm not going to be influenced by the negative. I'm going to control my influence. Now, quickly, because uh, we have so much wealth of stuff here and so little time. Uh, verse number three, look at this picture. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. I want you to, to take this away just kind of as, a, as a, a, a summation here. This picture does not, it's, it's, a, it's a pastoral, and I don't mean like a pastor of a church. I mean like the, past, the green pastures of a well-tended garden or farm or, or, or even a healthy, a healthy wood or a, 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 a healthy... You get the idea. There's this, there's this country quiet to it. There's this peaceful, let me sit in my rocking chair. It's a tree. It's steadfast. You know, modern life does not incline us to this kind of life. Um, you have to think in terms of rats and rat wheels. <laughs> running on that wheel, running, 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 running. Uh, we oftentimes even think of a spiritual life in terms of continual battle. We're fighting with the devil. I would like you to see this not in terms of your spiritual purpose, but in terms of the life that you live, the feeling of the life. Who can rest the easiest? The guy who knows how the book is going to end. You ever read a really good novel? And the, 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 the novelist is beautiful at characterization. He, he or she is just delightful at their characterization. Just f- talented at their plotting. It's rare to get both. You either have characterization or plotting in most novelists, but that's off the subject. So let's say they have you. You care about You're in this book. You're, you're just turning them pages. What's going to happen? And the character gets in this horrible circumstance, and you just think to yourself, oh, my goodness, the end has come. And if you're a dramatic reader, you're like tearing up. Unless it's a Greek tragedy which had had a wholly different purpose than the modern novel. (laughs) Uh, Why is it going to be okay? Because they're writing a book about this. (laughs) You know, somehow, at the last moment, when all hope is gone. So it is. So it is that the person who knows how the story ends can rest the easiest. Serving God ought to feel more like that than it does this desperate scrabbling. And you say, well, I'm not, that's not, it feels like desperation to me. Then you need to learn from Psalms number one. And you need to learn how to lean back on the promises of God. And let your life take on the stability of a scene that is filled with solidity and confidence. Lord, help us all to live that way. Can I have a big amen? amen? All right. Verse number four. This inversion of the idea. It's still a rhyme. It's just not in a synonym. It's an antonym. And so the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. I want to take a moment here just because we're looking at Psalms from a Bible study perspective to point out to you that sometimes the necessity of the poetry, the style of the writing, the rhetoric itself will give you an image that if you try to take it out of the realm of poetry and do theology on the back of poetry, you set yourself up for misunderstanding and even false doctrine. Let me give you an example. This is a perfect example. Now, if you read this as a poem, you would... You, you would you would see that he's given you an image and you would not try to do theology on the back of it. I'll give you at verse number 5. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. And so you read, not being true to the text, not understanding it in context of everything else the Bible says in judgment. I've actually heard a person make an argument off this. This is why it sprung to my attention. It's not in my plan for the lesson tonight. But uh, where, where you say, see, see, 
Uh, this, this idea that we're all going to be judged, the Bible plainly says that, that, that sinners are not going to be judged. No. What you did is you took an image out of context and now you're doing theology on the back of poetry. You want to do theology, what do we do? We rightly divide the word. We look at everything the Bible has to say on the subject and scripture interprets scripture. You don't get to pick one and stand on it. Judas hung himself. Go and do thou likewise. Uh, So the point is, if you get into it and you look at the term, what he means by stand, in other words, to stand in the presence of royalty is to have royal approval. And the court of royalty, a condemned man does not stand. But it lies prostrate on the ground. You under, okay, you guys, I'm moving along. I don't want to spend time on that. And so this, we must understand that there is over and over, even in the messianic images, there are things that on the shallowest level, it sounds as though it's in con, it, it is, it, it is somehow doesn't fit with what happened in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, but this shows the limitations of translation. You have to see the intent. You have to take the time and care enough to see the intent and to understand the basis of poetry, the rhetorical words. Things can be rhetorically true that are not literally true. I could stand here right now and say, I'm so discouraged, I just wish I'd have died when I was little. Now, I'm speaking rhetorically, right? Very few people think when you say that, you literally mean you wanted to die. Am I, am I beating a dead horse? Well, let's assume that you get it, okay? If you don't, God bless you. Uh, so, this contrasting idea, the ungodly are not so. Then it's the opposite. Their life is turmoil. The wind drives away. They have its solidity. They cannot stand in the storm. They shall not stand with approval in the judgment, etc., etc. And so this is the contrast. <clears throat> this is the introduction that the psalmist wants you to see. He's not preaching a message. He's not teaching theology. He's singing you a song. And the song goes like this. With God, everything is right and in order. With God, there's beauty in life. There's purpose in your days. But to live without God is to live a life without solidity. A life without purpose. A life that in, in, in some way is ultimately empty. In that the disconnect between creator and creation has caused a division in purpose. This is the song he's going to sing. And it won't sound like our song. But Psalms number one is one of the beautiful Psalms of the Word of God. It is an answer to this question. The original, uh, I, I don't know if I should say original, but one of the original questions of human philosophy was, what does it mean to have a good life? What does it mean to have a happy life? Uh, Socrates uh Asked the question of all his succeeding generation of students. What is the good life? This writer is answering that. What is the good man? What is the blessed man? And gives us a picture in a song in Psalms number 1. Now contrast from Psalms number number 1. To go into Psalms number 2. Which is... Uh, a change of style and pace. And just give me a, a few more minutes. I won't keep you long. I, you know I never do. I have frequent flyer miles built up. So even if I went long one time, you would owe me for all the times I respected your time, right? <laughs> uh, the ultimate victory of the Messiah. Psalms number one is a picture of the kind of people we ought to be. Psalm number two immediately is a picture of the coming Messiah. And so this psalm has four voices. Imagine if we were to have a a, a similar song, we would have four soloists. And each soloist would sing a certain part. And when they were done, the second soloist, you will occasionally, if you come to uh, a service where we have a, a choir, you will occasionally hear this hand off 
of focus where one singer sings and hands it off to another. There is four voices that will sing in Psalms number two. Psalms number one, uh, excuse me, in, in Psalms number two, but the four voices in this psalm, starting at the verse first through the third verse, this is the protest of the nations against God, against God's plan, against God's will, against the Christ. From verses 4 to 6, this is the response of the, the second voice that is singing. This is the Lord's reply to the protest of the nations. Number 3, that's the Lord's protest. Number 3 is the introduction of the Messiah. Number four is the psalmist's reproach to those who would stand in the path, in the way, in the will of the Messiah. And so, very quickly, these are familiar words. You will have heard them and they are beautiful in their, in, in, in just in the sound and the rhetoric. Uh, beautiful, beautiful language. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed messianic saying let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us this is the first voice what duty do we owe to our creator the leaders of this uh, world ask why should we be beholden why should we not deify ourselves and we decide the moral uh, level and we decide the right and wrong let's cast away any duty we have to God let's lay aside any obligation we have to God that is the protest of the nations against the Lord and here is the Lord's reaction in heaven he who sits in the heavens shall laugh the Lord shall hold them in derision then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his uh, displeasure yet I have seen my king on my holy hill of Zion. This is the view of earth's protest from heaven. Remember, this is a song. And for generations they gathered and at the temple worship and the tabernacle worship, they would speak this and thousands of Hebrew ears listened and reminded themselves in their heart that their God was great and their God was in control. It's not just us who are given these words. And sometimes when we read them with a modern review we miss the beauty because you need to see it as a tabernacle, as a temple, see it as an individual, see it as a shepherd on a hillside that's heaven's response God is not troubled by earthly rebellion our most heinous rebellion and rejection at best causes comedy in heaven now although you would think that a laughing God was a God who didn't care you're going to be surprised because the God who laughs at our rebellion doesn't stop with a joke. You ever look back at yourself, BC, and think about the crazy stuff you did? Now, I, I, I grew up in the church, so I had to do some crazy stuff as a half backslidden young person. That is not a get out of jail free card, just so you know. <laughs> the God who laughs at our rebellion doesn't laugh and walk away, He laughs and opens His arms. Verse number 7. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. And the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Interesting. It's poetry. It resonates with the Hebrew view of what a royal a, a divinity would do. How would they handle it? And yes, it is that the spiritual strongholds are broken. But it's not that the humanity at the heart of the struggle 
can be destroyed. It's not so the believer or uh, the person calling upon the Lord can be destroyed. No, it's principalities and powers that are broken so that that which is contested over the souls of humanity can be saved. I'm almost done. And so you see this final reproach from the songwriter. Having introduced this idea, he is going to end with this. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. And you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. And so, let's summarize it in a modern way. There is a war going on. And there is a rebellion that started in heaven but has fallen to earth. And that which is contested over is the souls of humanity. And there are those who are going to ally with the, uh, ally with the rebellion. And there are those who are going to accept within themselves that their only hope for true redemption is through the life, death, and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say that seems like an oversimplification. Well, it is, of course, by a necessity, an oversimplification. That doesn't mean it's not true. Because through the Lord Jesus Christ... We have victory. And to all who would rebel against his plan, it's not going to work, the psalmist would say. You can burn the Bibles you gather, it's not going to work. You can persecute the church in communist countries, it's not going to work. Jesus is victorious. Let's all stand. So let's make this real personal. Here we are, living our life. Troubles on the left, troubles on the right. How's it all going to end? Well, the psalmist would want you to know, God's in control of it all. So right now, you look at the circumstance that you're living through, what's troubling you, and you look it right in the eye, and you tell that circumstance in your own heart, in your faith, you say, God's in control. And I may not understand, but I put my trust in the one who is worthy of that trust. I put my hope in the one who literally can make a difference. And although weeping may endure for a night, and although brother Robert might be sick for a week, and sister Michelle might be bedridden for a week, Weeping is real, and it endures for a night. But don't stop the song with the tears. Don't stop the song with the weeping. You finish the song, a day's coming, when this one in whom I have placed my trust is going to take me up out of this world. This flesh, which gets tired and weary, is going to put on immortality, and I'm going to forever be with the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Let's praise them all across the house right now. Lord Jesus, we magnify you. We worship your name. We glorify you today. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Before we go, take your neighbor's hand, put a hand on their shoulder, whatever's appropriate, whatever you're comfortable with. I want you to pray for them right now, that person you're standing by. I want you to pray the protection of the Lord on them for this week. I want you to pray victory in their walk with God. I want you to pray in faith right now. I want you to believe your prayers make a difference. And I want you to pray a prayer of intercession right now for that person. I pray. Pray your keeping upon them, Lord Jesus. You know how to open the door that the enemy would try to keep shut in their life. You know how to bless them in the very area where the enemy's trying to hurt them. And I'm going to speak it. I'm going to believe my prayers make a difference here tonight. I'm going to believe that I can stand in the role of an intercessor. And I'm going to speak it right now in Jesus' name. Bless my brother. Bless my sister. Give strength to the weak. Give hope to the, 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 the spiritually discouraged. In Jesus' name we pray.
Oh, hallelujah. I feel victory in the house here tonight. I feel victory in the house. Thank you for watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Come, worship with us.